here at the ISMB in wonderful Prague. Like for all of you, this is very new for us because we're running as a full conference track at ISMB for the first time. CAMDA has been running since 2000 and as part of ISMB since 2011 as a satellite meeting originally. And um, it's with great pleasure that I can welcome all of you here. CAMDA is perhaps a little bit different and unusual to many of the other sessions that you will find at ISMB because um, a large focus of this meeting is on a community-wide experiment where we have a large international data analysis contest um, that the people that contribute contribute uh, talks and presentations to our session have, have uh, undergone. And I invite all of you to contribute to selecting um, the winner in this open data analysis contest. You will receive an email inviting you to cast a vote. And um, we have a number of uh, topics, uh, different data contest data, uh, contest data sets that people have looked into uh, this year. And the, um, the, the two days are grouped into sessions accordingly. And these sessions are accompanied by, by beautiful high profile keynotes, by inspiring leaders in our field that um, highlight the cutting edge work and directions in which uh, we are all moving. And with this, it's my great pleasure to welcome Lodewig Wessels um, to, to our podium today, who will give um, the, the leading keynote um, for the, the session on um, the cancer data set. Lodewig Wessels is a kindred soul in a way. He, he comes from um, computer science and engineering. He has done his training and uh, PhD uh, from Pretoria in South Africa and has then moved to the Netherlands um, where he um, uh, is at the Technical University of Delft and where he, he heads the Netherlands Cancer uh, Center. And I'm very much looking forward to his presentation of, of his cutting edge work on computational analysis of um, cancer data sets in the context of precision medicine. Lodewijk, I much look forward to your talk. I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk here at this workshop about our work. Um, I've actually, I'm not the director of the Netherlands Cancer Institute, but I am employed there uh, and also part-time at the TU Delft. Um, so I prepared three talks. I wasn't sure how far I was going to get to with those, so we'll see how far we get. In fact, just before the talk, I decided to change the order of them. So I'm going to start with the second one, which is on data integration and response prediction, uh, and uh, then go to the second one, which is more on integrative modeling. I thought that might be more interesting for this audience in terms of data integration, as well as using pathway and network information. And if there's some time left, we'll go to the first one, which is about using logic models to try and predict drug response in cell lines. So starting with the, first, the second talk, which is yeah, about the integration of data, I think we're all faced with the problem if we have multiple genomic data sets to determine how we're going to integrate these data sets. Uh, how is the information between them shared? Which one is more important? And with which one should I start? And so forth. Um, and what is the optimal integration thereof? So this is the setting in which we investigated this problem. So this is part of the genomic of drug discovery in cancer uh, 1000, so the GDSC 1000 data set, where about a thousand cell lines have been characterized for their response against uh, 265 anti-cancer drugs. Um, so uh, this response is measured in terms of the IC50, so the concentration at which about 50% of these cells die when you put the drug on them. Uh, so if you have a high, high IC50, it's a very resistant cell line. With a low IC50, it's a very sensitive cell line. For these cell lines, we also have multiple data types, as indicated here. We have mutation data, we have copy number data, we know what the cancer type is where the cell line was uh, generated from, we have methylation data, and we also have gene expression data for each of these cell lines. 
Is it perhaps possible to have the lights uh, slightly dimmed here in the front? Can we turn off the lights somehow? No idea. So we have a, a data set consisting of multiple data types and we also have an outcome variable which is response in this case. So uh, what typically happens is that you would take your favorite machine learning approach like an elastic net regression and for a particular drug, in this case a MEK inhibitor, you would then try to select from these uh, data sets the features that best predict response. So in the first approach one could imagine that you, if you take the simplest approach, you would take one data set at a time and then see how predictive this particular data type is for the outcome. And what we then observe if we have the predictive performance on the axis here and here the different data types is that there is information in each of these data types. So each data type in and of itself can actually contribute to predicting the response to a particular drug. So if we now go to the second approach then we would say okay we don't want to do one data type at a time. We do all the data types simultaneously and therefore I refer to this as the flat model because in this case all the data types are basically on the same equal level. And if I were to do this and use once again, for example, an elastic net regression in order to select the features and build a classifier, what turns out is that only gene expression features are being selected in this classifier to predict the drug response. So this turns out to change this graph where we have the relative contribution of the different data types on the y-axis again. So Gene expression is very dominant because most of the predictive capacity comes from the gene expression features. Uh, it doesn't exclude the fact that there are some drugs indicated here for which uh, mutations are predictive and there are some drugs for which uh, gene expression is not the, mo the mo major contributor or has a smaller contribution. But the message from this uh, exercise is when you put all the data types in the flat model, gene expression is the data type that's pref preferably selected. Uh, so I've shown you that all the data types actually have uh, predictive capacity, so, uh, but if you join them all, uh, then we see that uh, uh, gene expression is exclusively selected and the performance uh, of all together is, of course, uh, comparable to gene expression. So gene expression is a good predictor and there's absolutely no problem with that. I can imagine that some of you think, oh, what's your problem? You've solved your integration problem. We all have to use gene expression to predict drug response. And that's, uh, that's a fair comment if you want to make a, a diagnostic classifier, for example. But typically we are interested to know what's actually going on in our classifier. We want to learn more about why these uh, cell lines respond to drugs and why others don't respond. So we typically want to go into the features and try and interpret them. Uh, and typically, I think those of you that have stared to gene expression signatures might know that these signatures are typically not that interpretable because you end up with a list of 50 to 100 genes and you can do functional analysis on them, but you don't really get a very good grip on the mechanism. Uh, we, we actually prefer, especially in the, in the targeted or the precision medicine community, to think about uh, proteins, mutated proteins, and their particular uh, drug that inhibit them. For example, the well-known example of the BRAF inhibitor, Vemorafenib, uh, where we see here the IC50, in other words, the response of the cell lines. So these being very sensitive cell lines and these being very resistant cell lines. And that's highly correlated with the presence of a mutation in BRAF. So the BRAF mutation is present in the protein, the inhibitor inhibits that protein, and hence the presence of that mutation is a predictor of sensitivity to this drug. This is how these, uh, how we'd like to think and argue about uh, these mechanisms of response in cell lines. And that you don't get from the gene expression signature. On the other hand, we do know that much of the upstream variation is captured in the gene expression. So if there's a mutation upstream in some kind of signaling pathway, we typically have a gene expression signature downstream that reflects whether that uh, mutation is present in the cell line or not. So that's one of the reasons why gene expression signatures are selected, because they kind of capture the phenotypes downstream of the upstream variables. So what we did was to actually define uh, somewhat arbitrarily two classes of data. So the upstream data, which uh, we just uh, uh, designated as mutations, copy number, the cancer type and methylation. So those would, roughly speaking, be the variations that appear in upstream in the signaling pathways. Uh, such as mutations, and then downstream of that we would see the effect in gene expression. Now we could argue whether cancer type is upstream of gene expression, but in this case I think you would agree with me that particular cancer types have their own gene expression signature. 
So uh, the flat model basically treats all the data types equally. You stick them all in a, in a classifier and you predict drug response. Uh, what we then decided to do was to use a two-stage approach, hence the name tandem. So first we use the upstream data types in order to predict the response to a particular drug. And then, based, and then we try to uh, explain the residuals which we obtain by subtracting this prediction from the actual responses with the gene expression data. So the upstream data gets a first shot at explaining drug response, and what we cannot explain with the upstream data we do, we try and do with gene expression. So I've shown you that the flat model basically only selects gene expression signatures as the features with most of the predictive capacity. If we use tandem, we see the gene expression is still the one that contains most of the information, but now all the other data types also have some predictive capacity in these models. And an important fact is that the performance of these models are very similar, so we don't actually sacrifice performance by using this two-stage approach. So I promised you that these models uh, will be more interpretable, so the question is, are they in fact more interpretable? So a simple test that we can do is just to take all the features that were selected by the flat model and the features that were selected by tandem, and then do a gene set enrichment analysis on these to find out whether we find more functional annotations in these features. And as it turns out, tandem provides uh, more than twofold enrichment uh, over the flat model. So when we look at those features, they're better annotated than those selected by uh, the flat model. And here is just an example of the MAP kinase pathway. If we look at uh, uh, MAP kinase targeting drugs, uh, like the, the MEK inhibitor, which target this protein over here, this is the MAP kinase pathway going from RAS, RAF, MEK, ERK, uh, down to MEK and then down to proliferation. <coughs> Excuse me. And then we see in light green uh, the features that were identified by both approaches, and in dark green the additions that we see uh, when we also use the tandem approach, in other words, we can actually enhance the number of proteins that we, or the genes that we detect within this pathway that predict response to this drug. And I think that's plausible because the drug is targeting the pathway, so one would expect features within the pathway to have a large influence on response to that drug. Uh, I can also give you a few examples. So if we now again look at MAP kinase targeting drugs, and we make a plot of the feature importance, in other words, how much does this feature contribute to the predictive performance, and we rank them from the most predicted to the least, and they colored according to mutations being orange and gene expression being purple in this case. Uh, we see that the flat model, of course, selects BRAF mutation, that's highly predictive there, uh, whereas a lot of a slew of gene expression features are also being selected. If we now look at the tandem output, we see that BRAF is still selected because it's highly predictive, but in addition, we see that KRAS and NRAS are also selected, also in the pathway, and hence also plausible. What we also notice is that uh, some cancer types are being selected. Over here, some leukemias, and here, uh, skin cutaneous melanoma, or just skin cancer. And when we look back in the gene expression data, we see that a gene like BIN3 is selected, and BIN3 is a very good reporter of skin cancer. So I think also from that perspective, uh, a feature set like this is more interpretable because we know what the cancer type is where this drug is more effective rather than having uh, some kind of obscure marker for that cancer type. And the same holds for uh, these two leukemias which are being selected. These genes over here are also good markers of, that, of those types of leukemia. So uh, I hope to have shown you that at least it's more interpretable. So. Uh, we then were confronted by the fact, well, if we now add a new data set, what happens then? Uh, so this is just a small preliminary analysis. So this is when we use the flat model over here. Uh, all the data types now including proteomics, we see that gene expression still contributes most to the classification. But uh, in the presence of gene expression, uh, proteomics also pr uh, explains some of the variation. And when we use tandem, uh, we can actually see on the right-hand side that gene expression still contributes most of the variation, uh, but in tandem, the upstream data, of course, contribute, because we give them a first shot at explaining it, but at the same time, uh, the proteomics contribution actually goes down, so some of the information in the proteomics is also captured in the upstream data here. Uh, so it basically loses some of its explanatory capacity to the upstream data when we also include uh, them as upstream data. Um, but, and we'll get back to this point later on. So uh, just a summary at this point, uh, flat models are dominated by gene expression. Uh, 
partly also because much of the variation in the other data types is captured by gene expression. Tandem uh, provides a more balanced uh, representation of all the different data types in the classifier without sacrificing performance. Uh, and uh, we have more interpretable models because we have better annotation of pathways and uh, we don't have this confounding by uh, reporters of particular cancer types. Uh, and then uh, we went on to more formally look at this problem because for tandem we sort of intuitively chose what is upstream and what is downstream and then built the model. <clears throat> but you might also even ask within the upstream data, within the mutation, the copy number, the methylation and the cancer type, what is the hierarchy between these data types? Um, and uh, I've just shown you a quick preview of what you do when you add proteomics without telling you how we actually added the proteomics in the model. Uh, so you might ask what is the precise position of proteomics within this hierarchy? Is it upstream or downstream of gene expression? So we looked a bit more formally into this problem because there's quite a literature on inform in inferring hierarchies between data types using partial correlations. There's also quite uh, literature on matrix correlations. So if you want to know uh, how much information is contained between two matrices, or roughly speaking, how matrices correlate, there's quite some literature on that. And we will combine these to create a partial correlation matrix and to infer the hierarchy of the data types using this uh, type of uh, information about the correlation between matrices. So let's first look at the literature. There's, of course, the RV coefficient, where the RV stands for the initials of those that invented it. And this basically tests for shared information between different data types. So here's just a simple example. If we, do, if we take data type one and we do a principal component analysis and we find two groups of data there, and uh, the two groups are quite separate, but the samples within each group are kind of clustered together, and we look, take a second data type which shows the same kind of clustering but maybe in the PCA showing a different orientation with respect to each other, then the RV coefficient would be fairly high because the relative position of these samples with respect to each other are similar. Uh, if we now, now take a third data type and we see this distribution of samples, so they all kind of cluster together so there's not a clear separation, then we expect the RV coefficient to be approximately zero. So how do we compute the RV coefficient? So suppose we have two data types, X1 and X2, which is gene expression and mutation data. In this case, we have cell lines by genes in both cases. Uh, what we do is to basically calculate the similarity matrix between these uh, samples for each of these data types, giving us two similarity matrices, S1 and S2. Uh, this is what they might look like in the example that I gave you. So a bunch of samples that are very similar to each other, another bunch that are similar and they are dissimilar from each other. And what we can then do is just to calculate the RV as the uh, correlation of the vectorized matrices, so very simple. Uh, for example, if we have continuous data, which is gene expression, then we can use the inner product to calculate the similarity between samples, uh, and then we basically measure the similarity between gene expression profiles, if you will. If we have binary data, like mutation data, then we can use the centered Jacquard distance, which basically tells us what's the overlap in mutations between two different samples. And this is what we get when we use uh, uh, the cell line data set in order to calculate the RV coefficients between the different data types. So there's quite some shared information between gene expression and proteomics, uh, a bit more shared between proteomic, uh, gene expression and the other data types, whereas there's little shared information between, for example, mutation and copy number. So how can we use these partial uh, correlations to actually infer a hierarchy? So here is just a, a simple example. Suppose this is really the underlying system giving rise to the data, for example, a signaling pathway where this gene activates that one, which activates that one. Then if we just look at the correlations, we'll find that they're all correlated with each other. If we now look at the partial correlations, then we can actually see that the partial correlation of x1 with x3, given x2, is zero, which allows us to remove the link between x1 and x3. Uh, similarly, we can do this uh, thing for matrices. If this is actually the underlying ground truth between the data types, data type 1 giving rise to data type 2 giving data, the rise to data type 3, by partial matrix correlations we can now remove some of these ed edges if the conditional partial correlation is zero between those two data types as indicated there. So uh, having defined the partial matrix correlation, can we now 
infer this hierarchy between the data types. So we used, again, the, the cell line data, as well as some data uh, that uh, contained uh, RPBA proteomics, 206 cell lines, and 186 proteins. Uh, and the method that we used was actually the PC algorithm that was published by Martos, uh, which basically infers the structure. It's a kind of structure learning algorithm. So it first infers the structure using all these conditional partial correlations, and then it also attempts to learn directionality between the arrows to see if there's any kind of causality between the data. So this is basically what we get. Uh, what you'll notice is there are no arrows here because this algorithm indicated that there's actually no causal relationships that could be established between these data types. Uh, what we see roughly here is that we have what we initially called the upstream data, so the methylation, the mutation, the copy number, and the cancer type grouped together, and they are, uh, let's say, upstream, so to speak, of the gene expression data, which acts as a mediator between all these data types and the proteomics and the IC50. What's also interesting is that proteomics and gene expression show uh, a strong association, as indicated by the thickness of the arrow. And what's also interesting is that uh, in the presence of gene expression, proteomics still has some explanatory value when it comes to IC50. As we also saw earlier, when we do the flat model, uh, not only gene expression features are selected, but also proteomics features. Um, that's what I've already told you. So proteomics has additional information to explain IC50, even in the presence of gene expression. So what does this now tell us how we can use, uh, about how we can use tandem? So uh, we basically cannot infer which one is more upstream, the gene expression or the protein, purely based on the matrix correlations. So we can actually follow two strategies. We can use proteomics before gene expression, so still keep the upstream data as upstream data, and there was no clear hierarchy between them. And then we include the proteomics data. Uh, so once we've trained the classifier with the upstream data, we try to use the proteomics to explain the residuals. And what then remains in terms of residuals, we explain with the gene expression data. Uh, when, we, what, when we do this, we would uh, 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 expect to identify biomarkers with information that is distinct to gene expression. So uh, this will be distinct to the expression-based biomarkers, this will be distinct to the proteomics biomarkers, and this is roughly what we expect will come out in terms of the percentage of biomarkers from each data type in the classifier. Now an example of that, uh, so of a feature that's very unique to gene expression, is when we try to predict response to DNA damaging agents, uh, then we find the expression of the gene SLAFN11 to be uh, one of the most important features. And this feature is being selected whether we use the flat model or whether we use tandem. In other words, there's no other features that can explain the response to these DNA damaging features except the expression of this particular gene. We can also follow a different approach because we don't know what's more upstream gene expression or proteins. Uh, so, uh, therefore, we can start with the uh, upstream data, then try to explain the drug response, and based on the residuals, we then try to explain the gene expression, or we try to explain the residuals for the gene expression, and then only after that we add the proteomics. And what we then expect to find are biomarkers that are distinct to proteomics. So, when all the other data types have had a shot at explaining the, uh, the response, then we get to the proteomics, so we expect to find uh, features that are unique to proteomics. So this we actually applied to a colorectal uh, data set on which we had mass spec data in addition to all the other data types. And what you in fact identify there is in the last stage of tandem when all the other data types have had a shot at explaining the expression, there's still a significant amount of variation that we can explain with proteomics. And one of the interesting findings there is that the expression of ABC transporters, we just simply get rid of the drug when it enters the cell line, uh, have a strong association with drug response. So over here you see the expression of two of these ABC transporters, with red being high expression and low being, uh, blue being low expression. And down here you see all the different uh, 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 cell lines, all the different drugs where we find an association with these drug response, drug reporters, so about uh, 30 odd drugs. And over here you see the different cell lines. And you can clearly see that there's a strong association between the IC50 down here, where yellow means a high IC50 resistant cell lines, and blue uh, low IC50 sensitive cell lines, and the expression of these transporters with high expression correlating with resistance as we would expect. So I hope to have shown you that we have a method for inferring the hierarchy between different data types. 
Uh, we extended the RV coefficient for matrix correlation to partial matrix correlations. I didn't go into the details of how we actually compute the center jacquard distance, for example, uh, to compare uh, binary data types. Uh, and uh, the gene expression is basically acting as a kind of mediator data type, where we have the upstream data mediated by the gene expression and then the protein downstream of them, and both the gene expression and the uh, proteomics data being uh, explanatory for drug response. Uh, and as I've shown you, proteomics contains information that is not present in the gene expression, so it's certainly useful to add that in terms of explaining drug response. So in the future, we would also like to apply this approach to look at drug combinations. So uh, we have access to a large-scale drug combination screen of 756 cell lines across 30-plus drug combinations. And of course, the goal there is to explain uh, synergy between drug combinations. So I do, do I see a larger effect when I combine two drugs than when I'm only using a single drug? And here we can, of course, use the molecular data on the one hand uh, as something with which we want to infer a hierarchy. But we can also add the single drug response as a, another feature or another data type in this inference of the hierarchy in order to be able to explain uh, the uh, synergy between different drugs. So I hope uh, when I get another opportunity to show you some results on that. So now I'd like to move on to the second story, which is the, uh, the uh, pathway-based modeling of response to drugs in breast cancer. This is now a completely different angle to these types of problems. Instead of looking at uh, a large-scale uh, genomic data sets, we're now going to look at more focused data sets and a more focused question. So uh, as you may all know, or as some of you may know, and as I've shown you in the previous presentation, cell lines differ widely in terms of their sensitivity to different drugs. So here I show the uh, a compound AZD8055, which is an mTOR inhibitor. Uh, on this axis we see the concentration of the drug and on this axis we see the relative growth of uh, the different cell lines. Uh, so you can see that uh, this cell line here is a very resistant cell line because even at the highest concentration only about 60% of the cells are killed. Uh, this is a very sensitive cell line because even at low concentrations we already uh, inhibit the growth quite significantly. Now, if we make a very simplified diagram of the uh, pathway in which this drug operates, so the, uh, the p kinase pathway going from the surface receptors through p kinase mTOR down to growth, uh, then I guess the hypothesis would be in the classical paradigm that a cell line that has a p kinase mutation has activated this pathway and therefore it's dependent on this pathway. If we now inhibit downstream of that activation, for example mTOR, uh, then we would actually kill these cells that have become dependent on this pathway. And if I now plot in, in brown or red the, the cell lines that have a mutation in P3 kinase, uh, then we can see that there is a, a rough correlation between the expression or the presence of the mutation and sensitivity to this drug. For example, this guy over here is very sensitive and that, in fact, that cell line has a mutation in P3 kinase. However, there are some of them with mutations over here that are still quite resistant. Similarly, there are some wild-type cell lines here that are very sensitive. So this, this simple biomarker of a mutation of PSV kinase doesn't explain all the variation that we see here. So the question is, how can we understand this variability in the cell lines? And I think we can do that by computational modeling uh, that combines all the knowledge that we already have and, of course, uh, additional measurements on these cell lines. So, as you, may all, as you all know, we know a lot about the different pathways in which these uh, uh, mutations reside and in which these uh, cancer therapies operate. There's a lot of publications that come out every day about mechanisms that cause sensitivity and resistance to drugs in these cell lines. So uh, what we set out to do is, a, is develop an approach where we can actually combine measurements with all the knowledge and computational modeling. So uh, we collected a panel of 30 breast cancer cell lines uh, where we characterized them for drug response, in other words, how sensitive they are for a panel of seven drugs. 
Uh, we measured uh, the growth rate in time and we did molecular characterization where we did DNA sequencing, RNA sequencing, and we performed RPPA to measure uh, protein expression as well as protein modification in a, a set of proteins. And then we also took all the known and postulated mechanisms that I've shown you of how these pathways operate and what the mechanisms of resistance are. And we made a computational representation of that, which I'll show you in a second. And then combining the data and the computational representation, we can actually quantify the contribution of different drivers and drug sensitivity mechanisms in each cell line. In other words, we can actually determine how does this particular mutation interact with another mutation in a different pathway in order to modulate uh, response of that drug. And of course, a very important thing of this type of modeling is that we can take the model and we can actually compare it to what we observe and see whether the model fits the data. And in the cases where it doesn't fit the data, we can learn quite a lot about the mechanisms that we are trying to model and the data that we've measured. And then we try to refine the model and in that process actually uh, refine the model, but also learn more about the biology of how these cell lines respond to drugs. So, uh, Bram Tese set out to build this model, so we first started off with a very simple model of the uh, MAP kinase pathway, the PI3 kinase pathway, and as you can see here in breast cancer, estrogen receptor plays an important role in proliferation, so we simply added that as an arrow affecting proliferation, uh, adding the ligands and the receptors, and also further detailing the uh, PI3 kinase pathway uh, in terms of what's already known about it. In addition, we also know quite a lot about uh, copy number uh, variation. For example, there's a subtype in breast cancer called ERBB2 amplified because there's an amplification of this surface receptor. In addition, we know that PI3 kinase mutations occur and everything in red indicated here has already been associated with breast cancer. And the seven drugs which we tested the cell lines for are also indicated here with their particular advertised targets. For example, lapartinib, which inhibits EGFR and ERBB2. Now, this is all based on knowledge that we could already extract from the literature and from publications and from pathway databases. The question now is what are the relative strengths of these arrows that I draw here? In other words, when I have an ERBB2 amplification, does the, part, does the cell line signal down MAP kinase or down PF3 kinase? And if there are mutations, how does that affect the signaling and how does it in the end affect the proliferation? So a technique uh, that we used to uh, do this is Bayesian modeling. We use Bayesian modeling because of course we can include prior information about the variables that we know about their distributions. We can estimate latent variables, so all these arrow strengths that I told you about and all the activation statuses of the proteins, those are of course things that we cannot directly observe, uh, but we uh, get them from the model once we put the observed data in that model. Uh, we can certainly model uncertainty on variables, which is a, a big plus of Bayesian uh, modeling, so we can know when we can trust a variable and when we cannot. And there's, of course, a very well-developed theory to balance data fit and model complexity. So we can see when we are starting to overfit the data because the gain in fit is uh, uh, not outweighed by the uh, uh, increase in complexity in terms of parameterization. And it's, of course, an ideal framework to perform the data integration. So I'm not going, going to go into the details of exactly how we did that. Uh, I can share that with you if you wish. Um, so this is just to show you the uh, uh, website that Brom made. So down here we see the different uh, cell lines. Over here we see the different drugs. Uh, here is a particular cell line. Uh, we can select the cell line, BT474. Uh, this cell line has an ERBB2 amplification. And uh, what we show here are actually the outputs of the model. In other words, if the line is very uh, thick, then it's a strong signal, very wide, it's a strong signal. If it's very dark, it's a high confidence link. So as we expect, the ERBB2 amplification activates the ERBB2 protein very strongly. There's some weak signaling down MAP kinase, there's more signaling down the PI3 kinase pathway. And now we can actually select a particular drug like lapartinib, which inhibits EGFR and ERBB2. And then uh, we can play around with the concentration of that drug to see how it affects the pathway. So it, at zero concentration, the, disorder, the steady state flux through the pathway, and if we now increase the concentration, we can see that the activity down the PI3 kinase pathway is uh, reduced significantly. And this is also a cell line that's sensitive to lapartinib. Uh, so 
I told you that these models are useful in terms of explaining the mechanisms, so I think uh, we can look into an example of a response to the drug that I just showed you, lopatinib. So here is the map of the pathway again with the ERVV2 amplification in lopatinib, which targets these two surface receptors. Uh, so there's two resistance mechanisms that have already been published. One is an autocrine loop here, where there's an, a reactivation of MET by the excretion of HGF. And there's another mechanism, which is, of course, piezo kinase mutations. Of course, if there's an amplification here, and we inhibit this amplification, but there's a mutation that reactivates the pathway downstream of this inhibition, then we will not affect proliferation. So that's a logical one. So let's now look at the data that comes out of the model. So these are the variables that we actually modeled in the data. So the activity of the ERVB2 protein, the activity of CRAF, the activity of PSV kinase, which we cannot directly observe. What we can observe are, of course, the mutations present in PSV kinase uh, uh, in the helical as well as the regulatory subdomain. We can observe the ERVB2 amplification, and we can also observe HGF expression. At the same time, we can also observe the activity of some of these proteins, which uh, these have not been observed, but if there's a phosphorylation status that's measured on this, we can also observe this in the data. Now we can go through all the parameters and see what the model actually learned from the data and the representation that we gave it. So uh, over here I show you the, 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 the posterior distribution which comes out of the Bayesian modeling for this parameter which models ERBB2 amplification's effect on ERBB2, so the strength of this link over here. Uh, the blue line is the prior, so we told the model that we don't know anything about the strength of this link. And after seeing the data, the model was quite certain, because the, the distribution is very narrow, that it has a particular value of around 0.5. So that indicates that there's clearly evidence that ERBB2 amplification is activating ERBB2. And I've already shown you the thick black line in the, in the cartoon. That's where the line comes from. We can also go one step further and say, well, does this RTK now activate PRC kinase signaling? Uh, once again, it's quite certain about it. There's a quite strong value over here. On the other hand, uh, I've shown you that the signaling down map kinase is not so strong, and this is also reflected in this parameter, uh, the degree to which ERBV2 activates CRAF. It's certain that there is some value, but it's very small. Now we can look into the resistance mechanisms. For example, uh, does the PRC kinase mutation in the helical domain activate PRC kinase? Indeed, it does. It's not so certain about it, uh, but there is clearly a non-zero value. And then we can also look at the effect of the mutation in the regulatory domain on the activity of PSV kinase, which is this link over here. And we see that it's sure that it's not zero, but there's a high, uh, a very broad distribution, so it's very fairly uncertain about it. So uh, this uh, particular link and the one that I showed you before over here, the uncertainty is higher because we don't have that many cell lines with that particular mutation. And then finally, the other postulated mechanism is that expression of HGF would activate MET, so an autocrine loop, and in the data we don't find any evidence for that because after seeing the data we don't really uh, change our mind, or the model doesn't change its mind with respect to the uninformative prior. So if we now look at all the different cell lines and how their response is fitted to lopatinib, uh, on this axis I show you relative growth, on this axis the drug uh, concentration, uh, in black are the measured uh, triplicate uh, experiments of the response, and in blue, uh, behind that, I show you the, the posterior predictive of the model with the 90% confidence intervals. So it doesn't project very well, but uh, we also measured the mean square error over here. So in, in, if it's uh, bright blue, then it's a small error. If it's more reddish, then it's a larger error. Uh, as you can see by eye, there is a misfit over here. There's a misfit over there, and there's also, I think I have this slide to help me, this is a misfit over here as well. It's not too disconcerting because all three of these cell lines have a very high IC50, and the model also predicts that they are highly resistant. Uh, what we're more happy about is the fact that there are four quite sensitive cell lines that we actually accurately pick those out. Now, you may all know this famous statement by George Box that all models are wrong, but some may be useful. And I, I have to stress here that we don't think at all that we measure response to drugs perfectly here, uh, because uh, we don't measure, uh, measure and model all the mechanisms. 
but I think the models are very useful to learn something about uh, how these uh, cell lines respond. So, and we can learn most from the cases where the models fail to explain mTOR response. So here is an example uh, uh, of response to these cell lines to the mTOR inhibitor that I showed you in the very first slide of this part of the presentation. So there's a cell line that's very well fitted by the model, and there's uh, three instances where the fit is not so desirable. This sensitive cell line is, is predicted to be more resistant, here it's the other way around, and this sensitive cell line is also predicted to be more resistant. Then we can actually go back to the data, it doesn't project that well. Uh, we looked at two mTOR inhibitors, AZD8055 and BASE235, a dual mTOR inhibitor. And then we actually asked which proteins show differential expression between the sensitive and the resistant cell lines. And this is a, a volcano plot with uh, the effect size on this axis and the p-value on this axis. So you typically want to be in the upper corners in this plot. And I think what's also highlighted here is that uh, phosphor 4 ebp one uh, uh, shows a strong association with sensitivity, but also the total expression of 4 ebp one And that's uh, never taken into account because everyone considers only the phosphorylation status, so the activation status of 4 ebp one to be important. So in our old model, which didn't model the, the, the responses very well, we only had uh, 4 ebp one uh, activity as observed by phosphorylation status. Now in the model, we also included the total expression of 4 ebp one as, as you can see, the activation status of uh, 4 ebp one which is now a hidden variable which we model in the data, is dependent on 4 ebp one expression. And then we test whether what we observe here uh, links or matches what we actually observe in terms of the activation status as measured by phosphorylation. Uh, and when we look at these two parameters, we see, first of all, that uh, the effect of 4 ebp one expression on 4 uh, ebp one activation is actually very strong. So the model is very certain that this expression has a strong effect, which we also see from the volcano plot, so that's not so surprising. And it's very certain about that measurement, and it's very large, it's almost one. On the other hand, we also see that 4 ebp one ha now has a very significant effect on proliferation. So the effect of 4 ebp one activation status on proliferation is clearly strong after seeing this data on the new model. This is the prior. We assumed that it didn't have a large effect, but after seeing the data, it's quite certain that there is uh, an effect on proliferation. So this is the old model that I showed you with the misfits. This is the new model, and you can see that the fit is now much better. And we also went on to validate this in cell lines, so in vitro experiments. So what Kathy Ostrevsky did was to take uh, two cell lines that are most resistant to this uh, inhibitor, and she took uh, two inhibitors, the AZD8055 and the BASE235. Uh, shown in black is the parental cell line response to this drug. In green you see a, a control of, uh, expressing a green fluorescent protein. And in red, you see the one expressing 4 ebp one So uh, I think what's clear from these plots is that in all cases, for both drugs and for both cell lines, we can shift the IC50 quite significant, uh, because it's a shift on the log scale uh, towards a, f a far greater sensitivity. So this validates the prediction that the total expression of 4 ebp one is very important for sensitivity in these cell lines. Uh, so uh, what are we actually looking at? So what is actually happening in this part of the pathway? So here we have the mTOR complex, which signals down A6 kinase to uh, proliferation, also through 4 ebp one to proliferation. Uh, and we've seen that the effect of 4 ebp one on proliferation, which is an inhibitory effect, is clearly present and strong. So it is a, almost a 1.5-fold effect on the reduction of proliferation. So mTOR actually breaks, uh, uh, inhibits 4 ebp one and 4 ebp one inhibits proliferation. So this is a break on a break. Uh, so normally when mTOR is active, nothing happens because mTOR inactivates this break, so there's no limitation on proliferation. When we actually add an mTOR inhibitor, we of course remove this break on this break, and now this break can become active and it can actually reduce proliferation, and it does so by about 1.5-fold. So why is this interesting? I show you here a, uh, a karyogram of, of uh, breast cancer, so copy number profiles of about 1,000 TCGA breast cancer patients across all the chromosomes. Uh, what I highlight here is chromosome 8, where you can see uh, quite a large uh, fraction of the patients with a gain, if we zoom in there. 
This is the 8Q uh, arm, and there's also a recurrent amplification on 8P over here. If you now separate the patients with this 8P11 gain, this recurrent gain, we also see that they have quite uh, a much worse uh, outcome in terms of uh, distant, distant metastasis-free survival compared to the other patients that do not have this uh, amplification. So this is really a group that we need to find some treatment for or some specific treatment for. If we now zoom into this particular region on AP1112, I've shown the genes that are present on this region over here. On the left we see ZNF703, which is a bona fide breast cancer oncogene. On the right we see FGFR1, which is also a bona fide breast cancer oncogene. And right in the middle we see 4EBP1. So our colorant hypothesis is that for these breast cancer cells in order to become a tumor, they probably either have to activate ZNF703 or FGFR by copy number amplification. However, in the process, they sort of inadvertently activate 4-ABP1, which I've told you is a break. So there's sort of a built-in break in the cell lines, but they never see an mTOR inhibitor. So uh, mTOR inhibits this break, so the break never becomes active, so the cell lines, the cells can grow. So uh, the hypothesis is that if you now give these cells or these uh, tumors a mTOR inhibitor, we would take away the break on the break, and that would activate this break, which is exerted by 4 ebp one on proliferation, and hence uh, reduce the proliferation of these cells. But that still needs to be further validated. So co to conclude, I have uh, hoped to have shown you that we have developed a method to combine knowledge and data into semi-mechanistic models. Uh, biologically, I've shown you that the 4 ebp one overexpression, and not only its phosphorylation status, is important for mTOR sensitivity. We're now moving these models to the clinic where we uh, use a new adjuvant uh, clinical trial on uh, patients that get trastuzumab plus chemotherapy, and now uh, they also get trastuzumab plus pertuzumab and chemotherapy. Uh, and we basically uh, repeating these experiments, but now with the combinations of chemotherapy plus these drugs, because that's what the patients get. Then we train the models, as I've shown you, on these cell lines, and then recalibrate them on tumor tissue from the biopsy of the patient prior to treatment to try and predict what the outcome will be. So uh, uh, the proof of the pudding is in the eating, so we'll see what happens in this real data set. That brings me to the acknowledgements. So uh, the tandem story was done by Nana Arben, so also the, the hierarchical uh, uh, ordering of the data sets, the, the more theoretical work that I showed you, that was also done together with uh, Argus Milde and Johan Westreis from uh, the uh, University of Amsterdam, and uh, the work that I've shown you last, so the cell line work on the breast cancer, cell lines was done by Bram Thijs and Kathy Astrebsky in collaboration with Roderick Beiersberg. And I'd like to end there and take any questions. Thank you so much for a brilliant talk. We have time for questions. You need to speak really loudly so that people can hear you. We only have one. Oh, there's microphones over there. There's another one. I can yeah. stand here. Um, yeah. All right. Thank you. So going back to your first story on tandem, um, with things like elastic net, um, one of the challenges when you try to interpret the model coefficients at the other end is if you run that on highly correlated data, like you know is true with gene expression, if you rerun the models many times doing cross-validation, you'll get completely different model parameters with essentially the same you know, prediction. So I wonder if that's something that you see in your data as well and how you go about determining you know, how these things contribute to, to the biology of you know, the the models are not stable and you get different variables each time you run it. That's, that's a good point. On, on There's two points I want, can make about that. The first one is that, uh, of course, ElasticNet has been designed to try and cope with that problem of, of collinear co variables in order to be able to select them, where reach regression cannot do that. Uh, however, I think the problem comes in with cross-validation when you have different subsets of the data and then you might just pick out different collinearities. Uh, that problem remains and that can only be solved by looking at an aggregate across the cross-validations, of course, how frequently uh, features are being selected. And the other thing that we hope to achieve is that uh, we haven't looked at that formally, but what I would expect is 
because we now actually uh, feed the, the data types in sequentially, so to speak, in, in tandem, then we actually reduce the collinearity because you don't have a, a copy number variable that's still correlated with the gene expression uh, variable. So in that sense, you already reduce that collinearity. Uh, hi, this was a great talk. Uh, my question is also on tandem. So the data you're using has a uh, drug response for like many different drugs. So are you solving each of the, those problems independently from the other or all together or in a multitask approach? Yes, we're solving each problem separately. So as I indicated with the MEC inhibitor, we make separate models for the MEC inhibitor and so forth. But I guess your question is, is alluding to uh, 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 a transfer learning between the different models, so to speak. Uh, in, the, in, the, in, in, a, in the combination treatment, we actually looked at that uh, in terms of learning from different drugs, especially if you have a, a small number of samples. Uh, and there it turns out that if you do the transfer learning, it helps if you have a small sample size, but as soon as the sample size gets bigger, the individual models outperform the, the model that uses transfer learning. Hi, uh, great talk, thanks. Uh, so, you showed the data that uh, expression is the best predictor, uh, but prote uh, proteomics is little worse. Do you think it's due to the fact that you measure only a few proteins at the moment and this will change if you like, use mass spectrometry based techniques? Uh, that's a good point. So the data set that we use is in fact mass spectrometry. So we, we had about 6,000 uh, proteins and fossil proteins in that data set where I showed you the data of. Um, uh, and we also thought about this problem. Uh, so let me just finish that point. So in terms of the number of features, the gene expression, the proteomics was comparable because we also selected the most variable genes. But we also did a titration experiment where we changed the number of variables that are selected in gene expression from selecting the most variable uh, and then putting the cutoff of what we include uh, lower and lower. And then it turns out that that has really no effect because even if you use a smaller number of genes, uh, it still prefers to select the gene expression data. Hi, uh, thanks for the great talk. Um, so, still related to your first topic, um, you showed that Tandem uh, has a more or less comparable predictive performance with the flat model. Yeah. But how, how predictive is it if you restrict yourself with only the upstream uh, data types? Is it still good enough? And what do you think is the explanation or biological explanation why that for some cases, uh, the upstream data type could not explain the response, but then when you add expression, you can actually explain them better. Thank you. Yeah, that's an interesting question. So, um, as you've seen, there are some drugs which, which you can very well explain by, by mutation data, and that, I guess, also depends. There's, of course, noise in the data, so sometimes the, the mutation data is just more explanatory for, for the response. You saw on the BRAF uh, inhibitor that the BRAF mutation is quite... Uh, predictive for the response to that inhibitor. So uh, it depends on the drug. Uh, so some drugs are better explained by gene expression, some drugs are better explained by, by the mutation. Um, and and part, of the the part of the explanation of why, uh, I'm sorry, you, you're standing in front of the guy that asked the question. <laughs> no worries. Uh, so I think part of the reason I, uh, I already alluded to, and that's the fact that if you try and make a, uh, construct a classifier to predict the mutation status, the gene expression is already quite good in doing that. So uh, I think from that perspective, the gene expression has more explanatory capacity because it also includes uh, much of the variation of the upstream variables in them. Yes. So you mentioned the single gene is the most informative biomarker, I think it was Schlafen alone. Yep. Any explanation from the biological side why this is uh, so informative? Yeah, there's a, there's, a, there's a very very complex theory about the interaction between Slavin 11 and BRCA. Uh, there's already been uh, two publications on that topic. Uh, so apparently this is to do with immune response and sensing uh, foreign uh, material in the cell. So when you have lots of uh, breaks that are being, or aberrations that are induced by, by, uh, by chemotherapy, uh, uh, you, you, the, the cell seems to sense foreignness of DNA and then uh, this gene is activated and that activates a kind of immune response. So that's sort of vaguely from the top of my head what was uh, put forward as a possible hypothesis. What do you think about single cell data? Should we expect something unexpected uh, in terms of data integrations from single cells? 
Well, I think the first thing with single cells is that we uh, measure far fewer genes there with far less accuracy. Uh, I think single cell data will be most useful in terms of uh, getting lots of data more rapidly. Uh, if you think about every single cell being a data measurement, I think Sachs et al. already showed it quite a while back in, I believe, 2006 in their modeling of these pathways that I showed in the second talk, where they basically measured every protein separately in each cell, then you have thousands of data points. And I think that the, the paper by Schaeffer et al. in Nature about a month ago or so, I think they very beautifully showed how you can look at the variation in the population of cells in expression like uh, proteins like EGFR, which would explain why resistance comes up once you treat them with an EGFR inhibitor, for example. So I think from that perspective, single cell data will be very useful in looking at the heterogeneity in a population and better understanding why uh, a population becomes resistant in the end. Uh, do you see any subtype specificity when you look at the breast cancer cell lines? So they might be covering different subtypes of breast cancer? Yes, yes. Uh, we have ER positive and triple negative breast cancers in there. Uh, so we prefer not to model them separately because I guess that's your question. There's a large difference between ER positive and triple negative breast cancer. But we try to capture that variability by parameters such as the ERBB2 amplification, which defines one subtype, as well as the estrogen receptor respond, uh, expression, which also measures the other uh, subtype. So uh, if that subtype variability is very important, that should be captured by that variable. And whatever is shared between the subtypes, we hope to capture in the re remaining variables. Uh, maybe I can still get one question in. I, I would really like your approach of the hierarchical introduction of these different data types and figuring out how to do that. You mentioned that this gives you more a functional annotation. I was wondering, what do you observe in terms of model complexity when, when you approach these things differently? Yeah, so how many variables are actually being selected in, in, in the models in terms of uh, uh, comparing that to the flat model. That's a good question. We haven't looked at it. Nana is at the back there. He did the work, so maybe. Have you looked at how many features are actually being selected in the tandem model? It's about the same, actually. It's about the same, actually. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for the wonderful keynote. Thank you. A round of applause for this.